Do you know what time it is? It's supernatural story time. And if you're easily scared, and even if you're not, there's only one thing left to do. Just turn off the lights, because these are stories that you listen to only in the dark. Spoken of Only in Whispers, Volume 3, Story 1. This happened to me in the outbacks of Texas. I was staying with a friend, and rather than impose on them and sleep in the house, I was camping out on their 60-acre forest land, pretty much the boonies. Anyways, I had set up camp and my tent. I went to sleep about 11 p.m., zipped up my tent, and snuggled in. About 3 a.m., I wake up suddenly. Someone or something is scratching on my tent, right next to me. Scratch, scratch, scratch. I know I heard it because it's what woke me up. Coming to full awareness, I hear nothing. It's totally quiet and dark. I sit there for like two minutes listening. Decided it was just a dream. One of those phenomena that happens between being awake and being asleep. Then I look down towards the opening of my tent. The zipper is halfway up. Something has been here. And open my tent to look inside. I know it was someone or something because you open the zipper upwards. So it couldn't just open by itself. I totally get goosebumps, got my knife. One outside, nothing. Completely dead still. Then a branch cracked in the woods about a good 10 meters from me. I got so freaked I grabbed my blanket and started for the house. I slept there from then on. Damn haunted Texan woods. Story number two. Back in my younger days, I used to hike and fish all the time in a local state forest. I knew the trails and roads like the back of my hand and would hike for miles and fish at the ponds I passed by on my way. One summer day, I had been out all day and was killing the bass at one pond, so I wound up staying a little later than normal. It was starting to get dark, and I didn't have a flashlight with me, so I packed up and headed back to the car. So, full dark falls on me, and I still have a couple of miles of the trail to get back on, but no problem. The moon was rather bright, so I could see where I was going, so I'm walking down this trail, I see something out of the corner of my eye and my heart skipped a beat. There is a big creepy looking bald guy in a cloak or long black coat about 50 yards in the woods looking at me. I freeze and time just kind of stood still while we looked at each other. It was dark and the trees closed in tight in this area so I could not really make out any details of the distance between us. I just got the impression that he was big and was still looking at me. After a moment, I called out, hello? I probably sounded like a 10-year-old girl because I was scared. No response, no movement. At this point, I took off running for the car. I ran my little butt off, looking over my shoulder the whole time, expecting him to be chasing me or something. I made it to my car and peeled out for home. I told the buddy about it and he laughed and said I was full of shit. But we went out there a couple of days later after a few brews. We searched through the area but didn't find anything. In the light of day, I put it out of my mind. And we did some fishing. Later on that day, heading back, the sun was starting to go down as we walked down the trail to the car. At about the same place as I had seen the man before. I looked over into the woods and saw him again. This time, it was not fully dark. And there were no real shadows to play with my eyes. Off to the side, there was a path that ran into the woods and about 50 yards in, it went up a slight rise and there was a head-sized rock on the side of the trail. Under the light of the moon were the shadows from the trees and bushes. It looked exactly like a big, bald guy standing there looking at me. We had a good laugh about it and from time to time, would take girls there to see the man in the woods and scare the heck out of them. It was really cool and creepy how this patch of sand and a rock looked like a person under the right conditions. It became a big attraction over the summer as other guys would take people out there to scare them. But of course, pretty soon everyone knew it was an optical illusion. But it was great while it lasted. Story number three. When I was growing up, we had almost 400 acres, all wooded. Some old roads crisscrossing around. I sometimes got the feeling when playing in the woods I never ran, just 
watched close and made my way in another direction. However, as far as it being related to some primal fear thing, the dark or unknown, I don't buy that. As a teenager, about twice or three times a week for a couple of years, I'd knock my screen out and sneak out to go for walks at night. I would sometimes even just lay in the yard and stare at the stars. You could even see the satellites sometimes flying over. I've tracked the woods and those roads at night with no flashlight, just by the light of the moon so many times, it isn't even funny. Seldom at night would I get the feeling. It didn't come any more often at night than it did in broad daylight, but it came often enough in the same areas out there. When I was a young kid, I had a dog disappear. One day I decided to call him home. I was blowing a whistle and walking along the edge of our main yard and then I heard something in the woods and looked closely. At about 40 feet or so, I was something covered in hair and standing upright. Its head was concealed behind a limb. I beat feet to the house, convinced it was a bear as I'd never even heard of a Bigfoot at that age. I still remember it and remember how terrified I was. As I ran to the house, I just knew it was hot in my heels. My mom figured I was just imagining it. Maybe I did, but it was one of those woodsy memories I still have that makes the back of my head tingle to remember it. Next story. Back in 2006, I was home on leave. My family lives in the hills of East Kentucky, and we have a lot of land back behind the house. My grandpa, dad, and uncle built a cabin back there in 1990, and over the past 10 years, my grandpa built himself a few tree stands. Anyway, I was home on leave just before deploying to Iraq for the first time. Me, my girlfriend, my ex now, and my sister decided we were going to go up to the cabin and camp for the weekend. We decided that we wanted to sleep in tents outside, even though the cabin had bunks. Anyway, we had a fire going and had just got done with dinner, and it was about midnight. My girl and I got in our tent, and my sister got in hers. Well, we were asleep before you know it. I woke up at around 2 a.m. to the sound of someone trying to sneak around outside our tent. I couldn't see a shadow or the silhouette because the fire was out. Plus, I had a dark tent, which was heavily in a wooded area for the most part, and our cabin was in a small clearing, so not a whole lot of moonlight got in there. I had a weird feeling, much like that feeling of dread that people say they feel. I could clearly tell it was a human because of the way they were walking, like trying to sneak around. It was pretty hot and humid that night, and I was on top of my sleeping bag and the sheet, and my girl was wrapped up in. As I raised up to grab my Glock out of the front pocket of my pack, which was at my feet, I heard what sounded like nylon being sliced. That's when I heard my sister scream, which just boiled my blood. I'm telling you, I unzipped the screen on my tent and had my upper body out of that tent in under a second. When I got my head out of the tent and looked at my sisters, I see a guy hunched over in front of her tent looking directly at me. Before I could get a word out, this guy was headed for me. My sister's tent was only about 10 or 12 feet away from me. I could tell something was in his hand, but it had all happened so fast. I put two rounds in his chest as he was coming at me, and he hit the ground a few feet in front of me. This all happened really fast, guys. I know I've kind of slowed it down a bit, but it happened really fast. I was still on my knees when I shot him, so when he hit the ground, I stood up, and my training had kicked in. I stood up and was yelling at him saying, stay on the effing ground. Now, when I think back, it seems like I stood there yelling that same phrase for 20 minutes, but it was only about 10 seconds, I think. I grabbed his left arm and extended it above his head and then had to lift him up a bit to get his right arm up. My girl was up by then freaking out as was my sister. I didn't even acknowledge them. I immediately started scanning the area with my surefire and pistol making sure there were no other people with this dude. After I made sure no one else was with him, which took a maximum of one minute and around 30 feet away from my sister and the girl, I walked back over to the guy. He was still laying in a position that put him in, not moving, but still breathing. I could tell around had hit his lung from the way he was breathing. I only had some gauze and medical tape with me, so I put him up against a tree beside the tent on his side, the side with a good lung to the ground because that's how I'd been trained to deal with a collapsed lung. 
I plugged the exit wound up the best I could. After that, I had to pretty much yell at my girlfriend, who could hardly move from fear, to get her ass on the cell and call 911. I checked his dude's pocket and found what I thought was crack. Turned out to be meth. And in the other pocket, I found a tiny 22 that looked like a fake fun because it was so small. Anyway, to cut the story short, the state police got to my grandpa's house within about 20 minutes. He brought the first two troopers up on an ATV. The rest came up on a different road, which SUVs were able to get up. Turns out the guy was high as hell on meth, which explained why he lived for almost an hour after I shot him. Apparently, this guy was from the area and had been in and out of jail many times for drug and assault charges. We still have no idea to this day why he was up that far in the mountains, which is about four miles on private property and without any kind of gear besides a knife and that 22. He didn't even have a shirt on. The nylon I heard being sliced was a screen on my sister's tent. He had cut a big enough slice that he could have easily crawled in. We're pretty sure he came up there on the other road and seen us and decided to try to rob us. I don't know how he would have gone up there on the road from my family's home because they have lots of dogs and I know for a fact he wouldn't have been able to get by them. Now, I think I'm a pretty tough guy. I've deployed three times, once to Iraq and twice to Afghanistan. The first deployment being with a cavalry unit at Fort Campbell and the two to AFG with the 75th Ranger Regiment. I've seen plenty of combat, way too much for my liking. But to this day, this has been the most traumatizing, craziest, creepiest experience I've ever had. I think it was because the guy was after my sister. God knows I would die for her a million times over. She's the most important thing I have. I have no wife nor kids. And it really doesn't bother me that the guy died because he was a direct threat to my sister. Rather him than her any day. The what ifs is what gets me. What if I hadn't woken up at the exact moment? My sister could have woken up right there and he could have killed her. But luckily, I was there and I did protect her. Next story. This is something that happened to a friend of mine. His name is James. And we were friends all through grade school up until he moved away around 8th or ninth grade, I think. We were a little wild, but when he moved, he really got bad. All his brothers were thugs and dope heads and he was heading down the same road. I'd hear stories from time to time about something he did or was accused of, but didn't really believe it till I ran into him one day, a year or so after I graduated. We talked for a few minutes, but he was the kind of person I wanted nothing to do with. So I kept it short and went on. Years later, like 10 years or so, I had a job to remove some beavers from a lake at a church camp that was in the woods a bit. Turns out James was kind of a caretaker and was now a holy roller himself. It was a church camp, so I could only go and trap when there were no campers, and I never knew how much time I had. When I got the call that the camp was empty, I would hit it hard, setting lots of tramps, and even hunt by moonlight to get as many as I could. The camp is actually about two miles from my house through the woods, and I would walk in the evenings over to the hunt. One day, I was chatting with James and mentioned I would be back that night to hunt and he asked to join me. As I said, he was a completely different person now, so why not? That night, we climbed on the roof of this huge building on the lakeside, watching for beers in the moonlight, just talking about whatever. Finally, he started talking about all the stuff he had done in his past and why he was now a church person. He had been bad on drugs and was robbing and stealing all the time to support the habit. One night, he had gotten into a fight with his own brother over a dollar bill they found on the ground and nearly beat him to death. He said he actually thought he had killed him and left him without a second thought. A few days later, after zero sleep, he finally passed out in an abandoned building. He didn't know how long he'd been asleep there, but he suddenly was wide awake and it was totally dark outside. He said even though it was dark, he could see three things walking toward him. He was paralyzed with fear and couldn't move. He said the things were so black that they almost glowed in the dark, that they stuck out so much. Anyway, a loud buzzing was going on in his head and getting louder and louder the closer they got till they were on him and the noise was unbearable. He said when he came to, it was light outside. His clothes were shredded. Half of his hair was burnt off his head and his entire body was covered in little scratches. 
Even his feet under his shoes and socks were cut up. He said when he came to, he had never felt better and instantly changed his life for the better. Now, this guy was as rough and mean as they come. When he finished telling me the story, he was bawling like a baby. As I walked home through the woods that night, I thought a lot about that story. Sure, it could have been drug-induced or something, but he didn't think so. It could have been a dream and the burns and cuts from something he did when he was high, but he didn't think so. What he told me, whether it was true or not, he believed it 100%. I could tell that when he was telling it to me. I have no idea what happened to him that night, but I'm sure glad it did. I have no doubt he would be dead right now otherwise. He left that camp a few years later for some mission in South America, and I haven't heard from him since. That was probably six or seven years ago. Sitting there that night, hearing that story, and the power he told it with, and then the long walk home through the woods was enough to convert me, almost. By the way, I promised never to tell that story because he was embarrassed. So, I did change his name. Next story. This event happened back in 1994. It involved my ex-wife. At the time, I was a young police sergeant working for a small city. We didn't have the greatest backup in the world sometimes, and the chief and I alternated being on call every other week. I have always been a light sleeper and wake up pretty quickly. On one event, despite living a couple of miles from an incident, I was able to jump into my jumpsuit, which we had at the time for graveyard, or in my case for a quick backup call, and arrived at the incident from a dead sleep in something like six minutes. That point was made just to illustrate the stark difference in my actions normally and the night we had the object in our woods. My first house on the acre and a half was a starter double wide, 24 by 32 feet, thin walled box basically. On the west side of the property was a little gully and thickly wooded patch making up about a third of the property. There was Himalayan blackberry brambles all over, nettles and a good number of 80 feet or so tall cottonwoods. The wooded part of the property was a good eight feet or so lower than the level of the ground where the house stood. On the back side, the north of the property, was a narrow section of former railway right of way, and the train tracks and timbers had been pulled out of there in about 1989. There was still standing a trestle to the northwest of the house, just beyond my woods, but no rails on the trestle, just an old big timbered ghost of the trestle. Sometime in the middle of the night, no clue about the time, I found myself sitting on the edge of my bed, looking through my bedroom window towards the woods, and I saw a light appearing to move from the northwest toward the northeast, and the light was big and round, like a big headlight. The light was about 15 feet off the ground and seemed to be moving straight through the woods. There was also a deep mechanical engine sort of sound that sounded sort of grating. The thing is, nothing could go through those woods due to all the trees and such. If you tried to walk through it in the daylight, you'd have had to watch your step, and you would likely get scraped up. If the light was just barely beyond the woods, there was nothing on the other side of the woods at the height of the light that a vehicle could be on the other than the trestle. And the trestle was perhaps 10 feet off the ground, but had nothing on either side of it. No road or connection to anything. My ex-wife was sitting there next to me, looking out the window, and I don't remember us even talking about what it might be or anything. The really weird thing is that I had on a number of occasions gone outside to check on what the dogs were barking at and had grabbed my streamlight and my pistol. That's how I would have investigated the thing in my woods normally. But I didn't. I just apparently laid back down and went back to sleep. The next morning, that event seemed so preposterous when compared to how I'd normally deal with something that I started telling my ex about this crazy dream I had. She said it was no dream. She described everything I saw comparing notes and going out to check in the woods and beyond there was no sign of any vehicle tracks or anything and besides the object would have had to be at least 10 feet off the ground next story the story i'm about to tell you takes place in the saint francis seminary woods uh, it's a small few acres of wood in saint francis near milwaukee one day me and my friend 
wanted to go and play with the Ouija board there. His girlfriend called and was upset and crying, so he went to talk to her instead of going. Another friend of his and I decided to go instead. On the way there, she started mentioning something about a fox. And as soon as we pulled up and parked, we saw one. It was about 20 feet away or so, and as we walked towards it, it would kind of saunter away, but never completely out of sight. It seemed like it was leading us, so we followed it for a bit, maybe a few hundred feet, and it led us into a section of the woods that I never really went to before. And then the fox disappeared. So we sat down and played with the Ouija board, where we lost it, because we got some really weird answers. I don't remember exactly, but I remember we asked who we were talking to and got a name and some other things like that. I never believed that Ouija boards worked before, so I was kind of nervous, but excited at the same time. So, after we finished, we decided to head back. We are almost to the car when we saw another fox. We tried to follow that one, but it lost us right away. So we picked another spot at random and sat down with the Ouija board. As soon as we started asking questions, a breeze picked up and it started drizzling on us. It felt kind of ominous, so we stopped, packed up, and went home. I called my friend to see how things were. He said everything was okay, and I told him about our experience. He seemed really excited about everything and wanted to go and try it for himself. I told him I really didn't want to go, but he insisted. So we went back about an hour after I had originally left. We tried a few different places, but every time we would sit down with a Ouija board and try to ask questions, a cold wind would pick up and it would start to rain lightly on us. I told him I wasn't comfortable with this and wanted to leave, but he said he wanted to try one more place. So we walked into the usual part of the woods by the grotto. We sat down there and tried it once more. But as usual, I got a creepy feeling and it started to get cold and windy. So we got up to walk out. As we were walking out, I looked back and saw someone walking behind us. It looked like a person dressed in torn white rags with chains draped around them, walking swiftly behind us, sort of like if they were chasing us out. I started walking faster but didn't say anything. Once we got out of the woods, I asked my friend if he saw anything and he said no, but thought he had heard footsteps. Needless to say, I didn't go back there for quite a while. I think the woods were trying to tell us we weren't welcome that night. I don't think anything was trying to hurt us, just trying to tell us to get the hell out. Still, it gives me the creeps to think of that chain man. Next story. My house is haunted. It started a few months ago. My wife woke me up at 1.30 a.m. saying she heard voices in the basement. I listened and I could hear people talking. I got the handy Mossberg short barrel and pistol grip and the flashlight and I snuck to the basement door. I eased down the steps, still hearing the voices. I'm thinking a million things at once. I do not want to kill someone, but you don't come into my home. I have little kids. I'm thinking it's a crackhead or kids. We live on five acres surrounded by several hundred. I cannot see or hear my neighbors. Our home is in the woods. We have two large dogs outside and they had not barked. As I got halfway down the steps, the voices stopped. I'm convinced that someone is there since we both had heard them talking. I spent about 45 minutes searching every nook and cranny of the basement. I searched outside, nothing. I got back to my wife, she scared, and we were talking about what it could have been. We left the night light in the hall bathroom. As we were talking, I see the light in the hall change and hear the door close. Thinking I had woken up one of the kids, I went to the door but they're both in bed. This is not cool. I did not sleep much that night. A few days later, I was on my way home from the doctor and my wife calls and she's freaking out. She's downstairs, homeschooling the kids. She heard footsteps upstairs and thought I was home. But she was very concerned as she did not hear the dogs bark. She came up the stairs and called out to me and the toilet flushed. She was talking, thinking, it was me that I was home. She came down the hall and she said she felt a breath on the back of her neck and the toilet flushed again. We've lived here for 11 years. The toilet has never done that before or since that day. A good friend of mine came over one day 
and as he got ready to go, he went to the restroom. When he came out, he acted funny and got in his truck and left. Called me a few days later and told me he'd seen a white mist in the hall. He said it was about five feet high and didn't touch the floor. I've known him since childhood, going on 40 years now. He does not make stuff up. I never told my wife what he told me. A week later, she saw the same mist in the living room. One day I came home, nobody was there, and there was a pack of bananas on the counter and a packet of something else. I looked away and looked back and the bananas were gone. I couldn't figure out where they went. So I went to our room and I changed. I came back into the kitchen a few minutes later. And there was the bunch of bananas on the island and one of the packets was stuck in them. So many other things have happened and we built this house ourselves. The only thing I can think of is it has something to do with the land. I lived along the route that Sherman took from Atlanta to Savannah during the War of Northern Aggression. Our pastor came and blessed the home and a few folks said they would pray to make it go away. No luck. Doesn't hurt anyone, but you know it is here. My daughter's eight years old and my son is 11. My daughter says she hears people talking in her closet. My son will not go into the basement alone. We have not told them of the things that we have seen or heard, but they know something's going on because they hear the noises too. Tried to say it's the house making the noises, but they ain't buying it. And at this point, I just don't know what to do next. Next story. When I was about 13 or 14, this was around 1985, 1986, me and my father, who was a cop for 30 years, went deer hunting out in East Texas near Palestine off the Natchez River. Public paper company land, trees all planted in rose-like crops. I always found that kind of creepy being able to look down a row of trees and see so far it's almost like an optical illusion. Boggy Creek Monster Area. We hunted a day or so in one location with no luck. The weather was cold and damp. We decided to move further down the mud road to a more secluded place. We had a 4x4, four four, which wasn't so common back then, so our tracks went further than anyone else had been on that road. We slipped and slid our way down the road to a more remote area, pulled the truck in facing downhill. It was getting late, so we started gathering wood and had a fire going ready for our dinner. I heard a noise up in a tree above my head and some bark fell near me. Kind of startled me, but I didn't think much of it. The wind was blowing pretty hard. When I'm picking up sticks, something whizzed past me. I couldn't see it, but it made a sound. Walked over by the truck and my dad heard it also. This time it freaked me out. I hit the ground. I was instructed to get in the truck. Tailgate was down and truck had a camper on it. I dove in on the mattress. My father said we were being shot at and to stay in the truck and not to get out. By this time, it was pitch dark. Dad handed me a thirty-eight and told me to stay put and if he didn't come right back to take the truck and go get help. By this time, I was shaking with fear. Then my father walked off in the dark as it had become deathly silent. I lay there and it seemed like hours. Finally, I became curious, so I stuck my head up to take a look out the side window. Next thing is a flash of light that lit up the woods like a Roman candle and had a sound I knew which was familiar to me coming from a Smith & Wesson 686. Then silence and a few choice words from my dad then several more lighting flashes and it went deathly quiet again. And I just stayed there in this dead calm. Several minutes went by. Then I heard a truck start with loud pipes popping in gear and echoing through the woods as if it were at Indy. Silence again. Then my father came back and told me it was okay to come out. An hour or so had passed as we prepared something to eat and talked about what happened as well as the instructions of what we did and what could have happened and tactical scenarios he had learned from being a cop for many years. I sat on a log near the fire facing the truck. My father was wearing his pistol as well as me with a thirty-eight that I had carried while hunting. 
it was like I was having a bad dream straight in front of me. And behind my dad, two adult male figures came into the campfire. I about pooped on myself. I motioned to my dad in a panic and flew behind a tree with my pistol. The two men approached my father. And as I had done, my father was two steps ahead of me and had stepped back and had drawn a sidearm. The two men looked shocked and stated they had been squirrel hunting and become lost as darkness fell. He told them what just happened and they stated they didn't hear any of the episode. My dad gave them instructions on what they needed to do to get out to the road. And in the morning, we walked in the direction from which the bullets were coming and found the river. Some idiots were shooting at the water and the bullets were bouncing off the water and coming up by us. Funny thing is, I never remembered hearing a gunshot. Years later, when I was in the Marines, down range in the butts, the sounds of bullets popping in the sand became oh so familiar. I still, to this day, cannot imagine anyone walking up at dark or someone's campsite during hunting season. Needless to say, we'd had enough of this nonsense for one night, and neither of us got much sleep and packed up for a slight and headed home.